and hit record. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Monica McCoubrey, and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Education Division of Game and Park. So kind of a mouthful, um, but this is our this is our fifth overall fifth season, I guess we're going to call it of science of and this is our last one of the year and um, this is all our fall series. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the science of urban wildlife and um, I'm going to be doing just a little program here in a second, but I do want um, my moderator and my co host today to introduce herself. Um, so I'll let her take it. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Grace Guard. I am um, I focus as an educator on aquatic ecology with the Fish and Wildlife Education Division with Monica um, for Game and Park. So, um, but love urban wildlife. I'm excited to, to be talking about this today and hope you guys learn a lot. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions during your program or during the program today, you are welcome. We're kind of a small group. You're welcome to unmute yourself and certainly ask them or you can type them in the chat and we will get to them. Um, there's a couple of break points and there's questions at the end that we will get to and then Grace can kind of moderate those for you. And she obviously is very knowledgeable as well and can maybe even answer some of those questions. And I know we have some other biologists on, so please feel free to answer questions biologists if you see any that you can. So, all right. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen here really quickly, and we're going to be talking about urban wildlife today. All right. So um, urban wildlife is a really cool topic. Grace and I were just kind of talking before everybody got on about how interesting it is and how many um, aspects you can look at it. And the cool thing is when we talk about urban wildlife, it's different in every urban area. So right now I'm actually in Scott's Bluff um, sitting here and I was watching a squirrel across the street earlier from my hotel room. And the urban wildlife that people in Scotts Bluff and Gary are gonna find is even gonna be slightly different than the urban wildlife that people in Lincoln would see or Omaha would see. So, um, and especially in other larger cities like Atlanta, Detroit, New York City, you're gonna see lots of different um, animals and different species and a lot of biodiversity, even if people don't think of urban areas as a huge hotspot as far as biodiversity, it truly is, so. We're going to talk um, kind of a little vague about some of the animals today and then also a little bit about why do we care about urban wildlife, why do we want to study it, um, and how we can kind of mitigate some of those human wildlife interactions. Um, sometimes they're negative, sometimes they're positive, um, but kind of talking about why we have those interactions and what those benefits are um, for people and wildlife. So. Um, just to let everybody know, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, just make sure that they are on topic and that you are kind to everybody. Um, I'm sure we will not have a problem, but I just wanted to make this known. All right, and so we're going to talk a little bit about what exactly is urban wildlife. So thinking about urban wildlife, it's come a long way since the time of, um, you know, Jamestown when they first started and looked at different animals or when they were um, Nebraska was being established, it's changed a lot. And we all know that our urban areas are changing very rapidly. They're expanding. Um, there's more industrial places now. There's more residential areas. There's apartment buildings. All of these different changes in that kind of micro habitat, um, they really affect wildlife. And so it depends on what types of animals are coming in. And some animals have really responded well to human interaction and some have not. And we all know that. Um, some animals are even in areas because humans are there. We usually think of animals as they typically tend to avoid people. Um, some animals do, absolutely. But there are a lot of animals that love people, um, not necessarily that interaction with people, but what people leave behind or what people build for them, um, they benefit from that as well. So when we talk about urban wildlife, this could be really anything. It could be coyotes, foxes, bobcats, raccoons, insects, reptiles and amphibians, birds. Um, and again, it's going to be different depending on where you live, um, depending on where I am right now. And um, it just kind of depends on what that habitat looks like. So, um, and for right now, we are going to focus urban wildlife as far as that Nebraska state. So um, if some of you are joining us from other states, we are going to be talking about Nebraska today. All right. Um, when we also talk about wildlife that we see, this might not be native wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife that we see in urban areas that are going to be invasive. So uh, we'll talk about these in a little bit, but things like the house mouse or things like starlings, um, they are wildlife that we probably see 
quite frequently, um, but they are tend to be not native species. Um, but when we talk about a good urban wildlifer, um, a raccoon, a rabbit, whatever we're talking about, they are usually going to be generalist. So they're not too picky on what they eat. Um, they're very adaptive, they're strong competitors, and they have a very high tolerance of human disturbance. So that's kind of a key factor when we talk about that urban aspect. All right. So kind of through my research, I have found like biologists kind of group urban wildlife into four kind of designated areas. And it just kind of depends on how um, that degree to which either wildlife are harmed or they benefit from that human habitat change. So like we talked about, some animals really like what humans have done with the area and some animals do not. Uh, so one of them that we talked about are human obligate. So these are gonna be your domesticated animals. This is your cats, your dogs, your sheep, your cows, your goats, horses, those kind of things. Um, people definitely don't think about those as wildlife, but they influence wildlife. So they commute that community composition that they make for other animals. It's very specific. And a lot of animals, sometimes they compete with those animals, those domesticated animals. Um, domesticated animals sometimes disturb wildlife. We all know that cats are the number one killer of songbirds. Um, so that wildlife domesticated interaction. And like we also talked about, they predate on native species, just like cats as well, and dogs and other animals as well. All right, there's also human associates and exploiters. So these are gonna be also generalists or sometimes they're gonna be omnivorous. It just depends on the species, um, but they really take a full fledged advantage of the food that is supplied by humans. So this is not necessarily someone that leaves a can of cat food out for the raccoons or the possums, but it's, hey, I finished my sandwich and I didn't eat half of it, I'm gonna throw it away. So whether you think about it consciously or not, you are throwing away food, and you are um, making a meal for another animal, whether that be an ant or a bird or a raccoon or something. So um, human associates and exploiters, these are going to be things like raccoons, possums, the house sparrow, a lot of different types of birds, crows, starlings, finches. Um, they take advantage of what people leave behind. And then there's also human adapters. Um, these ones they utilize resources maybe from human dominated areas, but they don't always have an added benefit. So um, these are kind of kind of be more on the peripheral end of an urban area. Um, this is going to be your bobcats, your coyotes. Um, robins are in there, but we clearly see them all the time. Red foxes um, depends. Lincoln is known to have that urban fox population. We'll talk about that today, but also things like skunks and red tailed hawks. All right, and then human avoider. So um, just as the word said, they literally avoid humans. So if I was a wildlife, I probably would be this person as well. Um, they don't want to be in this area unless they are migrating through or um, they're just dispersing for the moment. So um, these animals have really high mortality rates. They have decreased reproductive rates. Um, these are going to be things like mountain lions and wolves. These are your usually larger predators. Um, whether people in Nebraska believe this or not, humans, um, are, what mountain lions don't want to be around humans. They just kind of come in contact sometimes. They're moving through. Um, they follow along the Platte River and they come in contact with people. They don't go out looking for people. It sometimes just happens as that interaction. All right, we're going to go some through categories here. Um, we're going to talk about some animals that you might see again in a Nebraska urban setting. And this is by no means only the animals you're going to see. This is only a quick little program. So there's a lot that I missed and didn't talk about, um, which might leave room for a second edition of this. So, all right, mammals. So one thing that I've kind of found is that People love urban wildlife, but they love urban mammals um, so much so that sometimes they want to hand feed them. Um, a lot of people, especially in the springtime, we hear a lot of people, especially wildlife rehab that is overflown with um, different animals because they see a baby bird on the ground and they take it and they give it to wildlife rehab thinking that the mother abandoned it or a deer or something. So they literally will want to hand feed them or they're jumping away from them because they want to avoid them. So they love, hate, relationship with urban mammals. All right, one of those uh, love-hate relationships is a Virginia possum. So um, these guys, we see them all the time in urban areas. We see them, unfortunately, as roadkill a lot of the times. And sometimes even when I see them in Lincoln, roadkill, I'm like, wow, I, I didn't think a possum would be in this area just because like 
in my head, why are you on 70th and O Street? Because this is a huge major intersection. But again, they are moving through. Um, so normally possums, they're very shy creatures, and then they make dens in places where we think they should not. Um, normally in a rural setting, they would sleep under places like the roots of an old tree, but in urban areas, they're going to use what's available, attics, sheds, garages, um, crawl spaces, porches, and sometimes even inside your walls. Um, usually they do not damage your property. They are nomadic animals. So they come in, they stay maybe for a couple of days and then they leave. The only difference would be right then is if it's a mom and her babies, she's gonna stay a little bit longer because it's safe and she wants a place to um, feed and kind of house her baby. So normally they leave, but sometimes they stay. Um, best thing to avoid these animals coming into your area um, is removing an attraction. So there's some reason that these animals are coming into your area. Are you leaving dog food out at night? Um, do you not leave your trash cans covered? Um, do you have a really awesome crawl space where a lot of animals go into? So it usually is best to remove the attractant of the animal rather than the animal itself. And that's true for a lot of um, these urban wildlife, not just the possum. All right, so here's one of those invasive animals. Um, and these are one of those animals that literally are around because people are here. Um, so we call this the anthrosphere. Um, this anthrosphere is the artificial environment that humans have created and mice love this anthrosphere. So um, these are named one of the top 100 um, world's worst invaders. They are literally everywhere. They have made homes. Um, they like to eat and gnaw wires. They live in buildings. Um, something that I found out is that male um, house mouse urine actually glows in the dark, like psychedelic glows in under black light. And so um, it's kind of interesting to know about, but it happens. Um, they also make 50 uh, fecal pellets per day. So this is marking territory. And again, the males will do that with their urine. They eat a lot of food. They literally will eat anything, cardboard, um, grains, fruits, vegetables, that kind of thing, anything that they can basically find. Um, one thing that I would thought was really interesting is that the University of Minnesota has done some studies comparing city mice to country mice and their brain cavities. And they have found that city mice had about 6% larger brain cavity than those rural animals. Um, they're not 100% sure why, but they believe that a lot of times city mice have to deal with things that urban um, or that rural mice do not have to do. Traffic, people, um, finding ways inside of walls, more predators. So um, it's kind of cool to think that brains and the literal capacity of your brain can change by just living in a certain environment. All right, squirrels. Um, these are ones that a lot of people want to have in their house or not in their house, sorry, um, want to have in their area, but also they don't want to have them in their area. I hear a lot of people um, always say that, oh, those squirrels, they ate my bird feeder or they ate the food that I put out for the bird. So it's again, another like love hate relationship with these animals. So uh, in Nebraska, you could possibly find some gray squirrels down in very, very Southeast Nebraska. Otherwise we're gonna have these things called fox squirrels. Um, they are the largest tree squirrels in North America. They can get to about three pounds. Um, we have a lot of people that send us photos of uh, squirrels and they're not sure what they are because they're very different colored. Um, so these can be uh, kind of a light brown or sometimes even a gray brown in color. And people always ask us, are those gray squirrels? They just kind of have a little bit different coat and it also depends on the season. Um, they can also be black. Um, they also have patches of white on them too. So there's a wide range of colors that they can have. Uh, they are considered a small game species within a season. Um, they do have the tendency to depredate grain and cornfields. Um, they can cause some minor damage to crops, but unless you have a whole cluster of squirrels, that's not going to happen. Um, but studies have also shown that city squirrels, they have a little bit different behavior than those of our rural squirrels. So they're a little less vigilant um, when it comes to predators, just simply because it's the city. You don't know, necessarily have to deal with that. You don't have to deal with foxes and coyotes and large birds and stuff. Um, but au contraire, we do have that in our city. So it is interesting for a lot of these different animals on how their behavior and their literally their physiological changes have happened. All right, raccoons. This is another one that people, they love to see raccoons, but they hate to see raccoons. Um, these guys can really cause some serious damage. Um, a lot of times people will find them in their chimneys. Uh, it's a great, safe, dark um, location. So what they will do is they will build their 
nasty little areas and plug up chimneys. Um, they will destroy your shingles and your sidings. Um, they will spread your trash around. They do a lot of damage. Um, they can live in your attics and your crawl spaces too. And they also can carry several different diseases and parasites. So um, just kind of familiarize yourself and educate yourselves on um, what uh, vaccinations you might need for your domestic animals that are around um, because there can be some um, domestic animal and wildlife interaction diseases as well as sometimes it's people can also get these diseases as well. So just kind of educate yourself and know what's out there. Um, these are also very difficult to manage. So if you have a family of raccoons, again, remove the attractant. What is getting those to your house? Is it you have a really cool crawl space? Maybe plug up that crawl space. Modify your home rather than trapping the animal. All right, bats. People are fascinated by bats and they are terrified of bats. Um, we know that bats are in the city. Uh, we see them all the time. We hear about them in people's houses. And the number one thing that people usually worry about is the contraction of rabies. So um, it could happen. They are mammals, but there's possibility and there's probability. Um, they're not known as one of the high, high cases of rabies, an animal that is carrying rabies. Um, when we really look at that, we look at things like foxes, coyotes, um, skunks, raccoons. Um, Bats are on the list, but they, to my knowledge, they are not the highest one that we need to worry about. Um, there was a study done in the urban parks of Detroit where they found, and this is probably nothing shocking, but this is just, again, that scientific evidence. They are finding less diversity and fewer numbers of bats in urban areas. So uh, the more rural or natural the setting is, you're going to have a higher biodiversity of the types of bats and a higher number of those populations as well. Um, when we get into the city, we have issues with human um, bat conflicts. Um, they leave droppings around. They roost in your attics and your eaves. A lot of times, if you call like a pest control place, what they will do is they will make sure the bats are out and then they will make it so that those bats cannot get back in. They can get out, but they cannot get back in. So again, modifying the attractant that has them coming into your house. All right, um, foxes. So foxes are, um, I remember the first time I saw a city fox when I was a little kid and I was like, it was kind of towards the outskirts of town in Lincoln at the time. And then ever since then, you kind of started seeing more and more and more. Um, and now we have a whole urban fox thing. Um, so really people have started, they think seeing an increase in the number of foxes um, pretty dramatically in the last five to 10 years. But um, we also don't, this is kind of anecdotal because we don't um, measure the number of foxes. We don't keep a um, tally or running total of urban foxes, but we believe that they have dramatically increased in the last five to 10 years. Um, biologists think that they are staying inside those urban, highly urban areas um, to avoid coyotes and their territory. So coyotes are ones that kind of sit on the very, very outskirts and they're keeping those foxes inside the city. Um, they're a little bit more adaptable than the coyotes and they're also a little bit more tolerant of people than coyotes. Um, they're very used to sitting in close quarters with people. Uh, Nebraska Land Magazine actually just had a very cool article. Um, our program uh, fur bear biologist, he had a uh, family of foxes that lived in his backyard and had some very cool trail cam images in there. And just kind of the, his boys started seeing them and, and how they grew up and their behaviors. And so it's nothing strange to see a fox in the city of Lincoln. Um, those of you that are in Omaha and other rural urban areas in Nebraska um, might probably see the same thing. They also have plenty to eat in town. They're not starving by any means. There's rodents, there's birds, there's frogs, there's snakes, um, lots of different things that they could eat. And um, one of the things people have talked about before is that they're worried that foxes are aggressive. They're not as aggressive as uh, coyotes or anything like that. But during the time that they have babies, they might exhibit this thing called an escorting behavior. People have sometimes said that they chase you, they growl at you. What they are doing is if you go by them and they have babies in their den, they are making sure that you are out of the way. They will not attack unless obviously you go in there and reach for them, um, but they will kind of follow you and then, okay, you're gone, you're good. I just wanted to make sure you were out of my way. Um, and then there is a study done. I'm not sure if it's continued, but I know they did it um, a few years ago where they were looking at to see all these urban foxes now, are they 
having diseases or why are they here or what's going on with them. So it's becoming a very, um, almost like a commonplace animal now. It's, oh yeah, I saw a fox. You saw a fox on your ring. It's, it's not this, um, wow, a fox anymore. Like, I still think that's cool to see a fox, but it's almost becoming just another animal that you see. All right, and coyotes, um, especially in Lincoln, we have had um, a lot of people talk about finding them at places like Holmes Lake. I know people have sent me um, even Snapchats of them like right outside their yard in the city. So um, even though they are called human avoiders, of, they normally want to avoid people, but they like to use residential or sorry, they like to use the kind of fragments around areas. So parks, golf courses, um, Holmes Lake in Lincoln is a quintessential habitat because it's a little residential, but mostly there's a lot of space for them to have. Um, they are finding a lot of food in the city. They eat things like rodents, rabbits. They could even eat fruit and sometimes deer. There's deer that are coming into the cities as well. Um, they also will take advantage of food that's left out by people. Um, so again, if you leave dog food or cat food outside, that's an easy meal for them. But one thing you have to remember is that when they associate people with food um, or access to food, they start to kind of get comfortable with people and we don't want that interaction to happen. So um, coyotes in those urban areas, one thing that they kind of have noticed is that sometimes they will even increase their night activity because there are fewer people out at night. They are usually crepuscular animals. So that means that they are active mostly during the dawn and dusk hours. What they are doing now is they're changing their behavior because of people. Um, they want to avoid those people. And so usually there are less people out at night and they are trying to um, do more of their activity than when they can avoid those people. All right, so those were our mammals that we see. Um, are there any questions? Oh, thank you, Grace. That was your There were no questions at this point. Great. All right, we will keep trucking then. All right, so we're going to go ahead and talk about birds. Uh, we see a lot of birds in the city, and this was one category when I was thinking about doing this there was like a thousand slides that you could have about birds. So um, I don't have a thousand, I promise you, but I'm gonna talk about just a few of them, um, some kind of cool things that I saw. Um, how about deer? Yeah, um, deer, I there are some in Nebraska. Obviously we have deer. There are places now where they're coming into really um, urban settings. Um, one thing that I live about 27th and Highway 2 in Lincoln, and there's a kind of a, a lot of trees in that area. There's a stream. It's a really wooded area. It's not uncommon to see a deer right in the middle of the city. And that means right there in the center of Highway 2 and 27th Street as well. Um, so deer are one of those that typically tend to avoid humans. Um, but again, sometimes they're coming into places where they feel safe, they need food, and um, kind of a lack of predators besides the usual car or the possible coyote or something. So we definitely have them. Um, there are a lot of animals that I didn't hit in here as well, but that doesn't mean that they aren't in those urban areas. Yeah, Monica, I'd also say like, I know in Omaha, there's a lot of those spots too, and like where Boys Town was, and they're kind of losing some of those fields out there. And so, yeah, I think more and more, um, they're looking for some sort of habitat in between all our houses. So as they kind of lose some of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Donna, good question. She saw foxes, but hasn't seen them for the past six months. Um, how can I encourage them without attracting coyotes? Good question. Um, I'm not exactly sure how to attract foxes to your yard. Um, I know Sarah's on the call or is on the webinar. If she has any ideas or if Will has any ideas, that would be great. Um, but I'm, that's a good question. I'm not sure if you can attract foxes, like, you know, you can attract bumblebees and things like that. I'm not sure. That's a really good question. Sarah, do you have hey, a- Monica. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, hi, Donna. Um, so I'm Sarah Nevison. I am a natural legacy biologist with Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, and I did a lot of research on foxes. It was a different species of fox, but I do happen to know quite a bit about them. Um, I would say the biggest thing is habitat. Um, so if you are able to have sort of a more wild part of your yard, um, whether that's an area where you don't mow or maybe there is kind of like a brushy area, probably going to be your best chance. Um, you might not actually have a fox live there, but you may be able to increase the amount of um, habitat and food 
because foxes will eat things like mice or birds. So if you have habitat for those critters, that might help encourage to bring some foxes into your property. Awesome, that's why I'm so glad you guys were on. So thank you, Sarah, good, good helping. All right, um, so back to birds. Um, we're gonna go with some house sparrows. These are probably one of the most common birds that you're gonna see no matter where you go into an urban area, whether like we talked about, you go to New York City or you're in Lincoln, Nebraska, you're gonna see these everywhere. These are one of those animals that are highly adapted to living around people. Um, one thing that I found, and I saw this in a couple of articles and it talked about they believe that some of the sparrows, since they are now um, really heavily reliant on people, is that their skull shape has actually changed because they're eating a little bit different foods than they would in a rural setting, which is a lot of a lot more starches. So um, they then um, also have the ability to digest that starch. Um, so they create that amylase, that um, protein in there that will actually digest that starch. So their physiological bodies are changing because of where they're living and their urbanization of these animals. Um, these animals also are good at making nests just about anywhere. Um, it seems that whenever you go to like Ace Hardware or Petco, any of those places with the big signs that are 3D and they stick out, they're one of those birds that will find a little spot up there to nest. So they're very, very adaptable, um, but they like those cavity areas. So again, somewhere where it kind of sits back in like a hole in a tree. All right, um, these are another like quintessential urban wildlife when you think about them. The rock doves or sometimes they're called rock pigeons. Um, these guys will live on skyscraper ledges and biologists believe that um, early on um, when these animals were first around, they believe that this is mimicking their breeding cliffs. So high up on a hill, these animals are clearly not um, living in those places anymore. They're more close to people, um, but they believe that is why they are very high up usually. And then every single one of these birds is started out as a feral animal. So long time ago, they have escaped um, domestication and um, when they were imported from Europe and then over time, they have just become a feral species. So um, this is sometimes hard to understand which is a rock dove, which is a rock pigeon, they're the same thing. There's so many different types of plumages. Um, one really neat thing is that there is a community science project called Pigeon Watch, and it literally is having people take photos of pigeons and their plumages so that scientists can kind of see um, what all these colors are. Because it's kind of interesting that these feral animals have changed so many different plumages and have so many different colors. So um, this is just one of those really cool things that um, the urbanization of wildlife and people have come in because people see them all the time and it's helping scientists gather that data using that community science project Pigeon Watch. So um, if you're ever looking at pigeons and you want to take a photo of them, you can join this community science project. You just search for it, um, Pigeon Watch, and it will tell you all the information on there. And then these birds, like we talked about, they're very adaptable to people. They eat pretty much anything, grain, seeds, fruit, trash. Um, and a lot of people, they have basically, they're here because of people. Uh, people leave popcorn on the ground. They feed them bread. Um, they're coming because they see access to food and they know um, people are going to leave food somewhere. All right, this is another one of those um, invasive species. Uh, this is one that was also originated from Europe and then they were purposefully introduced into the United States. Um, these are one of those Shakespeare birds that people talk about. Um, at one point, people were like, everyone in the world needs to experience the works of Shakespeare and animals that he talked about as well. And starlings were one of those animals. So they were purposefully released into the United States and they have flourished since then. So um, these are regarded as a huge pest animal, especially in cities. Um, they're very loud when they gather together. Um, people don't like this. And then they also leave a lot of fecal matter behind, um, which can cause diseases. So if there's thousands and thousands of and they're all pooping in the same area, that's going to start having diseases if animals touch it or um, run through it or eat something from it. So 
Uh, these birds are actually pretty smart. They can imitate other animals. They can even uh, do human speech as well. Not necessarily like a parrot here, but um, still they can imitate some parts of human speech and they pretty much eat anything which makes them very good generalists for living in a human environment. So they eat everything from pastries and insects, grains. Um, they can also eat parasites on mammals, which can be a good thing. And then they're found everywhere in probably every single major city. All right, and then I didn't focus on a specific raptor, but we all have seen um, raptors in urban areas. There's a really cool book that just came out a few years ago called Urban Raptors, and it's all about how um, raptors have changed over time to live in an urban area. So if you're ever looking for a good read, it's called Urban Raptors. Um, so urban animals could be anything from hawks, eagles, owls, kites, um, peregrine falcons that live in, for instance, on the state capitol in Lincoln. Uh, scientists believe that they have been around um, our neighbors as long as we have had neighborhoods, but they're slowly encroaching in, or there are some of those super brave raptors that come in and then um, start their generation over again in the cities. Um, they're pretty well adapted to living in certain areas. There's lots of high places for them to roost. Um, there's lots of other birds for them to eat, as well as rodents. Um, and they're pretty good at figuring out where all those things are. And there are even some owl species that um, they are at one time a grassland species. They started to become bold and live in urban areas because there's there's food, there's different animals, there's places to nest. So um, animals are definitely not dumb. They have figured out um, where the best places are and raptors and birds are no different. I think that was it, yep. Um, awesome, okay. We'll keep going. Um, so invertebrates are probably the largest category of urban wildlife that you're gonna see. Um, so this is everything, um, not just insects, but we'll talk about some other different types of animals too. Uh, spiders. So spiders are one that you probably see every single day. You just don't, again, think about it. Um, or maybe you do if you don't like spiders. But um, overall, you are never more than 10 feet from a spider. I just wanted to put that out for everybody. So right now, kind of sit and think about 10 feet. There's probably a spider somewhere around you. Um, they have inhabited human areas very well. Um, most of the time, we don't even know that they're there. Um, they can live their whole life and we never know that they're around. Um, some spiders move in when the weather cools down. We're going to start seeing that a lot here as the weather becomes fall. Um, but some are year-round residents as well. Um, cellar spiders, the really long-legged ones, they like to live in your areas and your houses. Um, wolf spiders will come in kind of when the weather gets cool. Um, there's also ones, though, that don't necessarily necessarily like coming inside, but they're very common when you go outside in your garden, like the black and yellow garden spider, the ones that are really big and make the very, very cool circular orb webs. Um, not all spiders, though, will spin webs. Um, people sometimes think all spiders, since they produce that silk, they will spin webs, but not everyone does. And then spiders are actually very beneficial, even if people are scared of them and they don't like them. Um, I love spiders. I don't necessarily want them in my house, but um, I know what they do is very good. They eat a lot of other bad bugs and sometimes they'll even eat other spiders. All right, this is one that probably no one wants in your house. Um, there's over 3,500 species of cockroaches in the world. About 60 of them live in the United States. Um, the two most common type of cockroaches that you're going to find are gonna be the German cockroaches. This is the most common. And then second one are going to be um, American cockroaches. These are the ones that, you know, live in the sewers and they live in kind of the more industrial settings. The German cockroaches are ones that you're going to find in residential areas. So like your house or hopefully not, but like your dentist office is kind of the first thing that came to my head. So um, they're omnivorous when they come to human food. Um, one thing that I found that was kind of neat is that the cockroaches, like the American cockroaches, will literally fight, like kick and hit each other with their legs. So um, kind of an interesting thing. I did not know that about cockroaches when I was doing this, but um, if you ever see two of them together, they could be sparring or fighting each other. Um, one thing that's kind of neat is that uh, urban wildlife, we know changes our habits and our changes our um, our behavior, well, animals are no different. So um, when you see a cockroach in your house, 
it literally can change your behavior. So it causes enough, sometimes in people, psychological stress that it can alter your human behavior. So let's say you're having a dinner party at your house and the last thing you want is a cockroach to run across your kitchen floor, but it happens and, and we know it happens. It changes that social stigma. You are now the person that had a cockroach run through your house. And so you're gonna be cleaning. You're going to be changing your behavior to not have that animal be attracted anymore. So um, it's kind of interesting how small of an animal such as a cockroach can change your behavior. All right, this is another one that you probably see quite often or you might not see it very often either. It is called a silverfish. Um, these are the ones a lot of the times when I see them, they're around like your window ledges um, and the edges of your window. They have something called a cosmopolitan distribution. So this just simply means that they are found anywhere in the world where conditions are right for them. Well, what does that mean? So they like places that are dark, damp, and warm. So your bathroom, your kitchen, your cupboards, your counters, anywhere in your house that is dark, kind of damp and warm. Um, they eat everything, cereal, flour, sugar. They will eat starch. Um, so they have that ability to digest that starch in their bodies. Um, they'll eat the glue from books. They'll eat wallpaper paste. They will eat your fabrics. Um, we know these animals have been around very long, um, about as old as cockroaches. And we know at that time during before the dinosaurs that they were not eating fabric and book paste and wallpaper paste. So they have literally changed over time to adapt to people. And they also kind of have a very interesting display as far as a courtship. Um, they will dance with each other. The male will lay um, his spermatophor, his sperm package, the female picks it up. And so for a very kind of ancient old animal, they have an interesting courtship display. And then um, most of the time they're active at night, but early in the morning is when I usually see them a lot. Um, like you turn the light on and they run up your windowsill or something like that. All right, and then flies. This is another very common one that we see. They're the most recognized pests in the urban environment. Um, Adult flies are usually active during the day. Sometimes you see them adult, um, one active at dawn and dusk, and they're usually attracted to odor. So um, again, removing the attractant from those animals so that they are not in your house or around you anymore. Um, there are also lots of populations of flies that come from natural habitats into urban areas. So that's a lot of the times what we see because they're attracted to all these smells that people are having um, that are not in those natural settings or rural settings. Um, some species are even found indoors during the winter and the fall. Sometimes you might be like, why am I seeing, you know, in the dead of winter, you're seeing a fly going around your house. These are ones that are living in your walls. They are living in your attics, um, in different types of rooms. These are the larvae that they have um, overwintered in, and now they are coming up as adults. All right, we have just a couple more things. Okay, we don't see any questions or anything, but um, we have a couple more things and then we can certainly open it up to questions as well. All right, reptiles and amphibians. These are not as common as things like birds and mammals and um, your insects or your invertebrates that you're gonna see, but they do happen. So even in the largest cities, Lincoln, Omaha, Atlanta, Detroit, you are gonna find urban reptiles. Um, in Nebraska, for instance, in urban areas, whether you are in Scotts Bluff or you're in Lincoln or Omaha, you're gonna see things like garter snakes. There's a lot of people who have garter snakes in their basements or they see them in the summertime. Um, racers are fairly common as well. Brown snakes, ringneck snakes, prairie rattlesnakes. Um, now, when we say urban, that doesn't mean your house. This means like in a city park or I know in North Platte sometimes, um, TJ Walker would send me like uh, a text saying that they saw a rattlesnake right outside the door of the Game of Parks building in North Platte. So again, a little bit more of an urban area, they are seeing these animals. Um, bull snakes and turtles are very common, especially like in city ponds. Um, there's lots of different types of turtles that you might see. And then same with amphibians. These are a little harder to find sometimes because they just require a little bit more of aquatic kind of wet environment. So frogs are not as common, but toads you might see a lot of. So especially in places like your city parks, your ball fields, your gardens, um, walking down your street, you might see a toad or a frog. Um, some that you may find in Nebraska are things like bullfrogs, your Cope's gray tree frog. These are the ones that are in Southeast Nebraska. Um, they stick on your windowsills or on your um, porches or something like that. They're pretty common in urban areas. And then also 
Woodhouse's toad is probably going to be the most common amphibian that you're going to find, and then your boreal chorus frogs as well. All right, um, we're going to talk just a really quickly about like disturbances and threats. So what is this threat um, for these urban animals? It seems like sometimes they have it pretty easy, but there's a lot of habitat loss. There's light and noise pollution that they have to think about. There's a lot of invasive species that call urban areas their home. Um, habitat fragmentation, chemical runoff, and lots of pollution. So um, basically what's happening is only certain animals are surviving in these urban areas, and that is causing a biotic homogenization. So what's happening is that all of these animals um, it's pretty much going to be the same animals in certain areas because they are the ones that are surviving. So um, these selected animals are going to be the same in lots of different types of urban landscapes. There are these generalist species that come in all cities. Basically, everyone else's population is diminishing and theirs is being fine because they're the ones that are surviving. So if we want to increase that biodiversity and we want to increase the numbers of animals that we're seeing, there's a lot of different things that people need to start doing. Um, these threats, there's indirect threats, there's direct threats. The direct ones is the structure and function basically of these areas. Um, for instance, like bat species, they're dealing with light pollution. It's a direct effect on their population. Frogs, there's a loss of an aquatic habitat that's directly infecting them. Um, some species are higher risk of disease. There's behavioral responses um, from some of these wildlife. So directly affecting these animals is something that is a threat. But then there's also an indirect threat. Um, so things, for example, for example, is if there's a large like mesopredator that comes into this ecosystem. Um, the native songbirds and the small mammals are gonna be in trouble. Um, it might not directly affect them, but that population might go down. Um, basically it's decoupling the predator and prey feedback. So it is messing up the, the numbers of predators and the number of prey in that community. All right, so what can people do to increase urban wildlife um, and to help urban wildlife? Basically, avoid wildlife conflict um, if you can, and the best way to do that is just that attractant um, about why that animal is coming into that area. So thinking about like your backyard or your garden, like block your trash cans. Sometimes it seems like a lot of work, but if you have like a fruit tree, just take all that uh, fruit from those trees sometimes and get rid of them if it's attracting animals. If it's not attracting animals, then leave it alone because a lot of other animals will use it. Keep your pets indoors, especially at night, um, especially cats. Um, domesticated animals, like for instance, in Lincoln, you can have backyard chickens and ducks. Keep those in an enclosed area, in a sheltered area at night. Um, use bird feeders that are specifically designed not to spill, or they're specifically designed at a target species. So if you want to attract cardinals or um, finches or um, chickadees, something that's really native that you want to do, make sure you target those species and not sometimes the unwanted ones like grackles and starlings. And then also be aware of just those wildlife borne diseases that could affect you and your pets. And then the last thing, why do we care about urban wildlife? Um, sometimes it might seem like an accident that they're here. Um, it's not. So um, like we talked about, wildlife can be found even in the largest, most dense city. And to me, one of the things that's really cool, especially if we're doing education programs, is that you're talking to people about these urban wildlife. It's a way for them to connect to nature. You do not have to go out into the middle of nowhere or to the country to find a caterpillar or a butterfly or a snake or a bird. So kind of getting kids interested in wildlife and people interested in wildlife and nature right in their own backyard or right in their own city. Uh, it also helps us understand biodiversity. We can help them maintain healthy ecosystem functions. We can foster a safe neighborhood. Um, we can also reduce the impact sometimes and those stressors on different wildlife populations. So if we know that this population of bats in this certain um, city is fluctuating because we just introduced these 10 times extreme light bulbs Maybe we need to change those light bulbs. So there's lots of different things that we could um, we could help with animals and people and reducing that conflict between them. All right, so that's all that I have for today. 
Um, but we do have the rest of our series, our fall series. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about amphibians, uh, Thursday, September 2nd, same time, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then we'll do prey plants. We're doing spiders and then eggs and migration. And then the series will be done for the year and we'll start again in 2022. Um, if you liked today and if you want to learn more or follow us, we also have a uh, Facebook page and Instagram page. And we also have our website. And we will put this on and our, all the other ones are on our Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. It's under the playlist Science Of, and this one will probably be available by Monday. Um, we'll get it up by then. And then with that, are there any questions, comments, concerns? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. So it was kind of a little bit longer today. Usually they're not quite as long, but any questions or anything from people? All right. Well, thank you to my co-host, Grace. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, and then for anyone, again, interested, um, next week, we're going to be talking about amphibians. And then give us about uh, till Monday to get this up. So if you would like to share it with a friend, um, it will be on our Nebraska Education YouTube channel under the Science of Playlist. All right. Yeah, someone had... Um, someone said, we sometimes have a lot of deer at Lake Zerinsky, an urban lake here in Omaha. I once saw 21 deer crossing the pedestrian path, yet I sometimes don't see deer for weeks and even months. Do you have any way to account for this? Um, for instance, do they move off to other locations or do they somehow hide from us at different times of the year? Um, it could be both. Um, one of the things, especially uh, when I usually see deer, it, it kind of just depends. One time I saw it it was like the hottest day of the year and they were just sitting out there. Um, a lot of times when I see them, it's starting when the weather changes. Um, so when it starts getting cooler, you're gonna start seeing more animals move around a little bit more um, just because of the heat and they're um, trying to get out of the heat and they're going to different areas. Um, it could be a lot of different things. It could be you were just at the right place at the right time. Um, Grace, do you have anything that you wanna add about that? I feel like you yeah, I think maybe also just moving to find food um, and then, yeah, I don't know, I don't know a lot about, like, when they're going into rut and all of that stuff as well might cause, you know, deer to be moving more often. I feel like, Monica, you'd know more about that than I would, but, um, but in an urban setting, I think they probably are moving around quite a bit because they're just looking for different resources, um, but Zerinsky is a good area for them, for sure. There's a lot of good, like, prairie in there, and, I mean, lots of woods for them to hide in too. So um, I don't know if maybe they're finding good things in people's yards and that's possibly sometimes why they might be moving across that street more often. So that's uh, a something, really question. Yeah, something else is also um, like if you have things in your garden, um, mm -hmm. that would be a good time to see them. They're gonna be unfortunately eating your, your vegetables and your carrots and things like that. Um, but also they have a huge territory. So like a squirrel is not going to move around too much because all their resources are in one area, but like a deer, they're a little larger and they're going to have a larger space or a territory. So they, that day that you saw 21, they could have been there um, just again at the right place at the right time, they were moving through and, um, but they are in that same area. You just might not see them all the time. So they could be hiding, there could be moving, there could be lots of different reasons that they are um, not seeing them all the time. That's a really good question. All right, any other questions? Otherwise I will let y'all go and we will hopefully see you all again next week um, for amphibians. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, thank you, Grace, very much. Thanks everyone. See you later.